have the lung capacity to do it. So I wanted to be with you today. Let me just start out by saying this is our resolution. The United States federal government should substantially increase its protection of water resources in the United States. And that, by the way, is one huge topic. <clears throat> yes, it's water, but it's also agriculture, which we debated for a whole year in 1986-87. It's also almost all of energy, which we've debated in 2008 and 9, and on bits and pieces of numerous other topics. It's an oceans topic, which we debated in 2014 and 15, and earlier in 2003 and 4. So for reasons that we'll discuss, you'll see this topic goes into all of those. And it may be the broadest resolution we've debated with precious little topicality defenses to keep it smaller. We'll talk about that on the negative on Wednesday, but yeah, this is just a broad wording. We did debate a water topic in 85, 86, and most coaches thought it was a good topic. Um, but the wording that year said, protect the, water protect the quality of water in the United States. But our topic, water resources, includes both quality, quality and quantity, as the author's topic paragraph clearly states. And water resources is broader than water. It includes things in the water, at least arguably, like fish and other creatures. So with that said, let's talk about some cases. My first slide talks about agriculture, but really there are several agriculture cases that we could talk about and will be talked about in this topic. So students, I think, will like to talk about CAFOs. Confined animal feeding operations. Yes, they pollute the water because the manure runs into the water and ruins drinking water downstream and so on. But obviously students, once they have a topical link, they will also be talking about humaneness and other things. There will be cases proposing to limit federal subsidies to, to factory farms, yearning for the day that we had just family farms because factory farms allegedly overuse fertilizer and herbicides, which run into the water and feed dead zones in the Gulf and also contaminate drinking water. There will be cases that will just flat out promote organic agriculture. There will be cases that propose to get rid of subsidies for biofuels, like the use of corn for ethanol, arguing that you know it overuses water for no good reason. Um, that biofuels are very inefficient and also let's use food to actually feed people rather than um, to make fuel, fossil fuels. So agriculture is a big old topic. Um, affirmative plans will either incentivize particular programs, environmentally conscious programs, or they will suggest that the Clean Water Act be amended to allow or to treat agricultural pollution as non-point pollution because right now the Clean Water Act only deals with point sources of pollution, not non-point. Another big old case, dipping into the energy area, fracking. More technically, hydraulic fracturing. And fracking impacts water in many ways. First, the process uses massive amounts of water, so it impacts water quantity, and very often in water short regions. And second, the water that's forced into deep wells is mixed with a toxic brew of chemicals. And as your debaters will read the evidence on this topic, you'll discover that for proprietary reasons, companies aren't even required to disclose the chemicals that they add to the water that they use for fracking. Third, the fracturing process itself, because it fractures deep rock formations in order to get the oil and the methane deposits, opens pathways to groundwater, thus contaminating them. 
And then fourth, once all of this is completed, this water that's been used uh, has to be disposed of. And there are numerous instances where groundwater has been um, contaminated as a result, but mostly it's injected into deep wells and who knows where that's going to end up. Inherency is easy for this case. We still have the Halliburton loophole. So named because Dick Cheney, who was the head of Halliburton before he became vice president under George W. Bush, um, he secured specific exemptions from the Clean Water Act for fracking. And so, you know, the EPA can't even regulate fracking. So, uh, what will the affirmative plan do? Well, the one that we have in Baylor Briefs just clear, clearly bans fracking um, because actually a side advantage is often going to be global warming as well. Mm -hmm. And that may seem abusive to some teams, but when you really think about uh, debate theory, the key question about topicality is whether the plan on its face is topical, whether it protects water resources. If it does, if it is topical on its face, then every other advantage flowing from it is fair game. So just the preservation of fossil fuels as an energy source, thus impacting global warming, especially the argument that methane is 20 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than even carbon dioxide. So they're going to be those arguments. Next, I think there will just be flat out climate change cases. Why? Because there is no shortage of evidence on this topic that climate change is a key destroyer of water resources. Aaron Brockovich wrote a book, Superman's Not Coming, Our National Water Crisis and What the People Can Do About It. It's a 2020 book. It's specifically mentioned in the topic paragraph that the Kansas coaches who wrote this topic um, you know, they quote from her and say this is a premier book on the topic. She says this, the quality as well as the quantity of water is affected when the climate changes. When there are massive floods or other events that shift how water flows in our country, it means that new substances, pathogens, microbes, sediment, salt water, infiltrate our drinking water supplies. Rising sea levels, deteriorating infrastructure means that saltwater intrusion is a serious threat to drinking water on islands from the Caribbean to the Pacific and even in Miami. By the way, everything that I quote during this session is really available for you in the handouts that Jana has made available to you if you look in the notes section that underlie the, the PowerPoint. So what to do about climate change? I mean, the inerrancy argument is pretty simple. U.S. continued reliance on fossil fuels, subsidies of fossil fuels, etc. Yes, the Biden administration is doing some things about the Paris Accords, but not really restricting the use of fossil fuels, <clears throat> specifically saying fracking won't be banned, etc. Solvency could be carbon tax, cap and trade, or just flat out the Green New Deal. So I think there will just be straight out climate change cases on this topic. Next is lead pollution. This is a pretty straight down the middle water case. It will start out focusing on Flint, Michigan. Remember what happened there? You followed the news back in 2014 and 2015 when the city of Flint, Michigan switched its water supply to the Flint River and it corroded city pipes, leaching lead into the water system and allegedly poisoning children. Um, with very high lead levels. But in the literature, there, it's, you know, many, many sources say this is only the tip of the iceberg. There remains a big national problem with lead leaching into drinking water, poisoning not just children, but everyone, um, decreasing learning capacity. There's an environmental justice component to this case because children in poverty are especially impacted. The inherency argument here, um, keep in mind we're in the Biden administration. If 
if the Biden, uh, if, if Joe Biden gets the infrastructure thing passed, the compromise, it's going to include a lot for water infrastructure, which will most likely replace a lot of supply lines. But the big inherency argument in this case is nobody is advocating or willing to fund the replacement of residential supply lines. So the city water system supply lines, yes, get replaced, but there's plenty of evidence saying that's the worst thing to do um, to replace just one source of the lead. It's actually gonna increase the leaching from other places. So um, unless you replace, fund the replacement of residential lines and the details of the infrastructure bill, if it passes, aren't yet clear but it isn't likely that it will fund the replacement of residential lines. The lead and copper rule establishes a, a limit for lead, but plenty of sources say there's no safe level of lead. And so we just need to fund the replacement of lead service lines, municipal as well as residential. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm maybe coughing occasionally. Wetlands is gonna be a big case and wow, it's a hard one to get kids to understand. Um, let's first of all, talk about the importance of wetlands. Wetlands for most of our existence as a nation were viewed as a nuisance. Swampy regions supposed to be drained, filled, made useful, gonna build shopping centers, etc. Pretty much everybody agrees that we've lost as a country at least half of our original wetlands. In the past few decades, however, there's been a recognition that wetlands filter and recharge aquifers and other groundwater resources. They are the kidneys of the planet. And so they have to be preserved. And the Clean Water Act is designed to do that. The problem is that the Clean Water Act only applies to waters of the United States, WOTUS, as you'll see it in the literature. Problem is that in the Clean Water Act, Congress failed to define WOTUS other than as navigable waters or tributaries of such waters. Okay, well, what are navigable waters and what are tributaries of such waters? This sloppy definition has led to decades of ambiguity and controversy. The confusion is best illustrated by a 2006 Supreme Court case, Rapanos v. United States. It ended in a 4-1-4 decision Kennedy, who was in the middle, reluctantly agreed with the four, and so it created a plurality decision. Um, Scalia, who wrote the decision uh, for the plurality, said that WOTUS should be limited only to clearly flowing navigable waters. Justice Kennedy, who was the one in the middle, who essentially voted with the majority to create a plurality decision. But in his decision, he disagreed with almost all of the reasoning of Scalia and said WOTUS should include any waters that have, in his words, a significant nexus to navigable waters. Justices Stephen Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer found it perfectly reasonable that wetlands had a hydrological collection to navigable waters, meaning through groundwater which goes interstate and therefore should be regulated by the Clean Water Act. So all of that remained up in the air until 2015 when in the Obama administration, President Obama decided that federal government under the Clean Water Act ought to be protecting more wetlands than we are. And he took the Kennedy language and the EPA in 2015 and the Obama administration said the Clean Water Act would apply to all wetlands with a significant nexus to navigable waters, essentially doubling the reach, the pre-existing reach of the Clean Water Act. But 37 state attorneys general from conservative states filed suit and succeeded in getting an injunction blocking the implementation of the Obama Clean Water Rule, which was that rule that I just mentioned. Uh, so it never really went into effect. The Trump administration, when they came into power, um, remember that President Trump famously promised to drain the swamp. And I know he was referring to something politically, but 
uh, as many environmentalists say. He also evidently meant it literally when it came to wetlands. Um, he had his EPA director, Scott Pruitt, officially abandon the clean water rule, replace it with one that they called the navigable waters protection mm -hmm. rule, but environmentalists quickly dubbed it the dirty water rule, recognizing that it essentially walks back federal regulatory authority for wetlands. So what has the Biden administration done? Well, your debaters will find that Biden has suspended the Trump dirty water rule, but has not attempted to go back to the Obama clean water rule, probably recognizing that without congressional clarification, uh, conservative court appointees, even more so than in 2017, would strike it down. We've certainly added a great number of conservative judges to the mix. So a lot of environmentalists say the only solution, and this would be the affirmative case, is to have Congress clearly define WOTUS in line with the Obama clean water rule essentially increasing the reach of the protection of the Clean Water Act as it applies to wetlands. So next, we have PFAS, which stands for PER and polyfluorinated substances. And you'll find a lot of sources talking about how these chemicals contaminate our water. They're heavily used chemicals for thousands of uses all the way from firefighting to a most common use is all non-stick skillets and all of that, they use PFAS chemicals. Um, Scotchgard carpet that's designed to not have things contaminate and stick in it and whatever, use PFAS chemicals. It's basically preventing sticking. Um, so, State and federal regulation, PFAS is inadequate. There's a, a lot of evidence saying the EPA has just gotten stuck on the very few number of chemicals that they're willing to regulate. And they haven't been willing to launch out for years in regulating new chemicals that are uh, impacting our groundwater. In the underlying quotation in the notes, you'll find this one from Michael Snow writing in the William and Mary Environmental Law and Policy Review 2020. Water is the primary vector for PFAS contamination. It spreads downstream from factories, often located on rivers. It seeps into the groundwater after firefighting operations, causing it to end up in drinking water far from the pollution source. The most common affirmative case, the one that we have in the Baylor briefs, and I think a common case, will just ban the whole family of PFAS chemicals using the precedent that was established in the 1970s for the banning of PCB family of chemicals. That was a, a very similar situation where it was well established that these were harming human health and the, you know, the EPA successfully just banned a whole family of chemicals, PCBs. The ban worked and there's a lot of evidence saying it would work with PFAS if we just did it. So next is e-waste pollution. Um, e-waste, you know, throwing away the computers and the cell phones and whatever, all of which contain a lot of toxic stuff. Great Lakes Electronics Corporation in 2021 says, problem is there's so much e-waste that the trace amounts have ballooned over the years. The toxic water under the landfill doesn't stop below the landfill. It continues to groundwater and sources to all the fresh water in the surrounding area. Not only is this bad for anyone using natural wells, but it hurts wildlife. That in turn causes the wildlife to get sick from lead, arsenic, cadmium, and other metal poisonings due to the high concentration of these minerals. So the federal government so far hasn't stepped in at all to require uh, the dispo proper disposal or recycling of e-waste. And so the solvency would be to require and fund e-waste recycling at the federal level. So there are a lot of coal cases that are possible. Um, the two main variants would be coal mining, certainly contaminates a lot of surface water, acid mine drainage, um, 
et cetera. But the second, well, Claire Gerald writing in the University of Colorado Law Review 2019, a byproduct of coal mining is acid mine drainage, which pollutes water with sulfates, metals, and high acidity. Acid mine drainage affects thousands of streams miles throughout Appalachia. It can render streams unable to support aquatic life and significantly impair their biological carrying capacity. But also when coal is burned, it's a problem. Coal is burned, it deposits mercury into lakes and streams and oceans. And the regulation of that as uh, smokestacks, you know, collect things, what they collect is coal ash. And the coal ash itself presents a problem because then it has to be disposed of. So Keiston Hall writing in the Emory Law Journal 2019, coal ash ponds pose a significant threat to the environment and human health. Coal ash is a byproduct of the electricity production process. It contains carcinogens like boron, arsenic, lithium, mercury. Typically utility companies store coal ash in ponds located near rivers and lakes. If coal ash is stored in ponds that lack an adequate liner, the coal ash can seep into the groundwater, travel to nearby surface waters, which may serve as a drinking water source for neighboring communities. President Obama tried to deal with this threat by having his Office of Surface Mining and Reclamation Enforcement issue something called the Stream Protection Rule. It was scheduled to go into effect in 2017, which of course was after his administration. But President Trump campaigned against it, arguing that we're killing coal. <clears throat> and early in the Trump administration, uh, he had Congress, his allies in Congress, overturned, specifically by congressional action, overturned the stream protection rule. Uh, when President Trump signed the congressional legislation striking down the rule, he announced it would save the coal industry and protect thousands of coal-related jobs. So. The inherency is still there for this case. Um, what could the plan do? Well, you could restore the stream protection rule. You could regulate coal as a non-point point source of pollution, um, unlike what we're willing to do now. So by the way, um, at some point I could just stop. And if there are comments that you or questions that you'd like to put in the chat, I'll try to pay attention to them. Um, but maybe we can trudge along until I see some down there. Native Americans, there's a whole group of cases here. We have one in the Baylor Briefs, but there are actually several possible Native American cases that are wildly different from one another. Um, pipelines is an obvious possibility, though the Biden administration has banned the uh, Keystone XL pipeline. There's a big controversy about the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, that runs through the, uh, goes 1,200 miles through North and South Dakota, Iowa, and Illinois. So the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation in North Dakota has been the site of conflict over this issue. A lot of controversy about the, the plan to run the pipeline under the Missouri River, contaminating um, cultural sites for Native Americans. So that's one possible case. Uranium mining is another case that I like. A uh, lot of law review articles about, especially about the contamination of the Navajo uh, areas with uranium mining. Um, it's been banned now, but the mining sites are not being cleaned up allegedly. You know, there's evidence both ways. And so contaminating drinking water on the Navajo Reservation. The case in the Baylor Briefs is just talking about water rights in general. Um, so Native Americans are supposed to have their water rights secured by treaties that they've made with the federal government. Um, but those rights have been restricted in a number of ways that have not allowed them, for example, to lease their water rights or to profit from water that's being use that theoretically belongs to uh, Indian country. So Adam Krapel, for example, writing in the Tulane Environmental Law Journal in 2019, the tribes have the right to water and can obtain the authority to improve it. 
tribes struggle to get access to water. On the Navajo Nation, for example, the average Navajo is able to use only seven gallons of water a day, while the average American uses approximately 100 gallons of water a day. And by the way, that figure is low. I've seen up to uh, average of water usage by Americans up to 400 gallons of water a day. Likewise, approximately half of tribal homes lack cleaning water or even access to a reliable source of water. Houses in Indian country commonly lack kitchen sinks, showers or bathtubs, flush toilets, even running water. So there will be lots of cases dealing with Native Americans. Um, one of the reasons that affirmative teams will like to do that is it's especially well shielded from federalism arguments or state counter plans because treaties are with between Native American tribes and the federal government leaving states kind of out of the picture. So you kind of eliminate a lot of negative strategy if you can deal with a case like Native Americans. So next would be just right to water cases. You may remember it was in the UIL uh, several years ago as a Lincoln Douglas topic, we debated a right to water case and it's the big controversy here is international, not in the United States, but there are many people who do apply it in the United States. Rose Mooney, for example, writing in the Notre Dame Law Review 2021, although United Nations declarations international law deem clean water a human right, the United States does not, and in 2019, more than 30 million Americans lived in communities with unsafe water systems. Like many environmental crises, clean water access exposes socioeconomic injustice. Water contamination disproportionately hinders poor and minority communities. Not only are water quality violations more likely to occur with water systems that service minority or low-income populations, but off-discussed solutions, such as privatization and regionalization, fail to address the unique barriers that poor communities and communities of color face. So the basic affirmative argument, and this is critique like, is that water is commodified, it's sold, it should be a public good. Uh, people in water have, and people in poverty have their water cut off if they can't pay their water bill, et cetera. Um, sufficient amount of water for life should be a basic human right according to this case. State of California, by the way, has, in their con has added to their constitution water as a human right. So there will be bottled water cases. Uh, again, from Aaron Brockovich and Superman's Not Coming 2020. In addition to cost, bottled water creates a ton of waste. The industry uses about 4 billion pounds of plastic in 2016 alone. Many of these bottles don't get recycled, clog up landfills and public trash bins. Plastic manufacturing plants that make the bottles have been known to pollute local drinking water sources. It's also controversy in the Western United States about bottled water companies directly withdrawing their water from aquifers, depleting aquifers. <clears throat> so it impacts, impacts water scarcity as well, especially in the West. Next would be desalination. We have one of these cases in the Baylor briefs as well. If you have water scarcity, one solution is desalination. It's being used in the Middle East. It's being used to a limited extent in the United States, big plant in San Diego. John Duff writing an Ocean and Coastal Law Review 2017. Fresh water in the United States is a limited resource and water shortages are recurring at an increasing rate. A 2013 survey conducted by the US GAO found that 40 of 50 state water managers in the US expected their states would face water shortages in the next decade. That number is up from 36 states addressing the same question a decade earlier. So you got water shortage, you're overdrawing river systems so that rivers are drying up, especially in the Western United States. Why not instead of using drinking water from withdrawal from river systems, use desalination. 
Inland waterways, last time we debated waters at the water topic, this was a big deal. Um, we, Marianne Bucci, director of the Port of Pittsburgh Commission 2019, our inland waterway system is composed of over 12,000 navigable miles, 240 locks that connect the heartland of America to the rest of the country and the world. However, like other modes of transportation, our river infrastructure continues to be inadequately funded. Failure or neglect in one or more of the modes of transportation has a ripple effect on the entire system and directly impacts our ability as a nation to remain globally competitive. So if you wanted to run this case, what you would really struggle to look for, it's a little hard to find, our agricultural system depends very, very heavily on inland waterways to move agriculture resources. And so what you would like to do is to be able to argue that we can't feed the world if we can't maintain our inland waterway system, which according to the American Society of Civil Engineers gets a D or sometimes a D plus for maintenance, um, slowing up the barges and river traffic and so on. There's another argument too, that if we can't use inland waterways, um, you go to trucks, which have a tremendously increased greenhouse impact than transportation by barge and so on. So there are those who argue that, uh, you know, we save our highway systems, uh, we save congestion, we save greenhouse impacts, et cetera. Oh, they're likely to be dam removal cases. This is when you worry about the salmon not being able to, you know, do what they normally do. Um, and other riverine creatures when rivers are clogged with dams. So, uh, you know, we, we have thousands of dams. I uh, think uh, you see the numbers all over the place, but 77,000 is a number that I've seen. Um, Mark Wildershine, Widershine, writing an environmental law reporter 2019, both industry and environmental groups have recently begun to assess the sweeping environmental consequence, consequences of obstructing rivers. Dams alter rivers in a variety of ways, reducing water levels and flow, preventing fish from migrating, altering water temperatures, decreasing oxygen levels, holding back silt, debris, and nutrients. These impacts are often destructive to fish populations and communities that depend upon them, producing ecosystem collapse and river systems that have been dammed. So environmentalists very often very promotive of dam removal projects. So offshore oil drilling and exploration Obviously, the big poster child for the problem here is the BP oil spill, which had such a gigantic impact on the ecosystem in the Gulf um, from that spill. But Abigail Andre, writing in the Georgetown Environmental Law Review 2020, says deep water, referring to Deepwater Horizon, which is the BP oil spill, captured the world's attention, but large spills are more common than one might think. In 2018, for example, the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, reported 137 oil spills ranging in size from 30 gallons to as much as 2.1 million gallons. On the U.S. outer continental shelf between 71 and 2010, there were 23 large spills of more than 1,000 barrels of oil or an average of one every 21 months. One study suggests that another event the size of deep water can be expected in the next 12 to 16 years. So inherency here is a little bit squishy because the Biden administration has issued a temporary halt to new leasing and exploration in the Outer Continental Shelf. Um, right, if you've been paying attention to the news, courts have recently blocked that. So that's one of those things where you gotta pay attention to the news. But right now, at least, the argument is that conservative courts are not allowing the Biden administration to block this, so it would require congressional action, either to ban all new oil drilling and exploration in U.S. waters or, you know, to significantly restrict. 
along the way on this case, a lot of evidence about destruction of whales and other uh, similar creatures uh, where the oil exploration uses techniques that damage their hearing with uh, sonic or booms and blasts, et cetera, that travel miles through ocean water. Marine protected areas is another affirmative case that we have in the Baylor briefs. The argument here is primarily, you know, preserving uh, fisheries, preserving coral reefs um, as the nurseries of the oceans. Kevin Lesky, writing in the William and Mary Environmental Law and Policy Review 2018, commercial overfishing has extinguished New England cod, snapper grouper reef fish in the South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico, various species of rockfish, the white abalone along the Pacific coast, the rock lobster in Hawaii, and the NOA estimates that 86 fish populations in the U.S. are overfished, especially when recent estimates place the ocean's production of seafood each year to 80 million metric tons. The need for their protection comes sharper into focus. While the negative will argue that there are a lot of MPAs, marine protected areas, um, not very many of them are no-take reserves. You know, they limit certain things, but they don't limit fishing necessarily, which is what you have to do in order to protect um, ocean populations. Aquaculture would be another possible affirmative case. This, by the way, can go either way. Um, the more common way is to argue, going to be to argue that aquaculture is bad, open ocean aquaculture or offshore aquaculture, arguing that it threatens ocean species with overuse of antibiotics with, you know, depositing all kinds of pollution, which uh, with releases of the engineered fish, which then interbreed with wild fish and weaken and destroy wild fish populations, et cetera. Existing regulation is fragmented. So the NOAA has issued regulations that affect so far only the Gulf of Mexico. Um, other numerous other federal agencies have different regulations. So right now it's just a kind of a regulatory muddle. Um, environmental groups are certainly arguing for banning aquaculture. Many, I should say many environmental groups are arguing for banning aquaculture in the open ocean. <clears throat> Friends of the Earth, for example, in 2018, these facilities are essentially underwater factory farms, but with less pollution controls. They're used to farm massive populations of fin fish in net pens, pods, and cages that provide no real barrier between the farm and the ocean. This allows for free exchange between the net pens and the open water, including direct deposits of untreated fish waste, diseases, parasites, excess feed, agricultural drug residues, chemicals, and anti phalans from the farms infrastructure and oftentimes spills and scapes of farm fish, all dumped right into the surrounding environment. So the final affirmative case that I have for you though, it's certainly not an exhaustive list, plastic pollution of the oceans, primarily coming from single use plastics. And some affirmative cases may focus on individual particular things like plastic grocery bags or plastic straws or balloon releases or all of the above. Marcella Mascara writing in the Environmental and Earth Law Journal 2019, the amount of waste from US consumers continues to rise and when it's disposed of improperly by poor waste management or litter, the trash finds its way into river streams and other waterways that end up in the ocean. Approximately 8 million tons of plastic waste enter the oceans every year which equates to dumping the contents of one garbage truck into the ocean every minute. This alarming information estimates that in 2025, for every three tons of fish, there will be one ton of plastic. And by 2050, there will be more plastic in our ocean than fish. So uh, right now there's no existing federal regulation on the production or recycling of plastics. <clears throat> the plan, what would it do? Uh, most likely to ban certain single-use plastics or require or, or fund, uh, fund 
recycling programs. So um, that's my quick review of affirmative cases. If any of you have questions or comments to place in the chat, I'd be happy to respond as best I could. So in my opinion, out of these possible cases that you've shared, what do you think will be some of the most popular and most used cases? I think fracking probably would be my number one, right along with agriculture. And again, when I say agriculture, there's so many variants of an agriculture case, but those would be my top two. I also have a sneaking suspicion that there will be a lot of just flat out climate change affirmative cases, just because there's so much evidence with direct links. Anyone else? How big of a role do you think the EEZ can play in terms of the affirmative? Well, that's a good question because it feeds into federalism arguments. So right now, the US exclusive economic zone um, goes out to 200 miles. Um, that's because we follow uh, the United Nations law of the sea, even though we haven't signed it. Um, within three miles of all US coasts, that technically under US law is governed by states. And so for example, in the area of aquaculture, Almost all existing aquaculture operations are within the three mile limit, which means they're regulated by states. Um, while there is open water EEZ aquaculture in the Gulf, uh, there's really none on the other coasts. Uh, there was one that was going to start in San Diego and then it kind of went kaput. So, big negative argument is going to be okay, look, if you're dealing with within the three mile limit, that's state regulated. Um, and if you're out beyond 200 miles into the open ocean, those are not waters of the United States. So it wouldn't meet the in the United States term in the resolution. Um, Dudley asked the question, is there much evidence about water recreation resources? Do you think it's a possibility? Yeah, there's a lot of evidence about recreational fishing and so on. Um, it's a big interest of environmental groups, you know, Ducks Unlimited, for example. Um, you know, they're a big in environmental group interested in saving uh, habitat. And uh, so interestingly, you know, groups that deal with recreational boating, recreational fishing, um, recreational hunting, all of them. Um, yeah, there's a lot of literature out there and there could be affirmative cases in that area. I certainly didn't mean to imply that I had exhausted the range of affirmative cases. This, this topic is just a broad one. Anyone else? Despite the fact that I've warned how broad this topic is, I think your kids will get a kick out of it. It gives them so many opportunities. It's also very informative. Um, after researching this topic for a year, your kids are gonna look at their bottled water in a different way. Um, they're gonna look at it a little bit askance in terms of how much stuff is still in there, even in bottled water. And certainly for tap water, um, there's just a lot of scary evidence out there about what we're doing to our water. So I think there will be a lot of good information. And negative teams are not without tools. We'll talk about this on Wednesday. Um, you know, the hardest thing about the topic is just its breadth, but there's some good negative arguments as well. A lot of even case-specific good negative arguments. All right, I'm gonna pause for about another 30 seconds to see if any more um, questions pop in.
All right, well, I'm a little bit surprised that my voice held out for an hour and a half, but it, it did reasonably well. I'm sorry that I don't have my normal uh, vocal volume, but it seemed to work all right. Okay, I guess we'll close it there.